Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panel of speakers today. Obviously, um, this topic of refugees, um, who they are, why they come, what happens to them after they get to where they're going, that's generated a lot of interest. Um, our panel is um, very well equipped to talk about these issues, and they'll do it as a tag team. Our first speaker will be Florian Yuswan, and Florian is, I'm going to read from my notes, an assistant professor of political science, and he's going to speak about the factors that lead to people becoming refugees, including civil war. Our second speaker will be Bill Smith. Bill is the director of the UI Martin Institute and Program in International Studies. He'll speak about the international refugee system, the resettlement process and responses to refugees by local communities. And lastly, Kristen Haltener, who is an assistant professor of sociology, will speak about how refugees affect their new communities, how they assimilate, um, and her research also includes studying why some Americans resist refugee settlement. Um, so I could tell you more about the speakers, I have their bios, but since it took us a longer time to get started, I think I'll just turn it over to our speakers and welcome and thank you for coming. So thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, we are all thrilled to be here. This is a, a fantastic event, and we really appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of our, our research and our work um, with all of you. So um, the way that I see my role in this is I just want to I want to set the stage. And my own research is mostly focused on politics in other countries, international politics, and my contribution here is to talk a little bit about to talk a little bit about the. Um, you're right. Go. Click it doesn't work. <laughs> to talk a little bit about the factors the, um, that lead people to become. Would you like me to advance the? Yeah. The, oh no, it works now. All right. <laughs> so to talk a little bit about the factors that create refugee flows in the first place. What are the conflict hotspots in various regions around the world that are creating those refugee streams that happen in the media so frequently over the past few months? Um, and then talk a little bit about what are the refugee statistics, who are the refugees in the United States, and who are the refugees that um, the state of Idaho has um, resettled in the past few years. So when you're talking about global refugee flows, um, usually, like with many political things, the best data that we have is last year's data. And um, the United Nations um, issued a report earlier this year um, that basically um, sh um, laid out how many people are there that are affected um, by, uh, by uh, persecution and by internal conflicts. And based on this United Nations data, we know that there are about 65.3 million forci forcibly display displaced people around the world. So to put this slightly differently, before I break down this number to you, I just want to put this number in perspective. What 65.3 forcibly displaced people means is that the number of people on the planet that are in this category equals the population size of the United Kingdom, or the, 20, the 21st biggest country around the world. So we can break this number down a little bit more. So 40.8 40 million people out of those 65.3 are what's called internally displaced persons. These are people who are affected by persecution and internal conflict and have been forced to move from their homes within the borders of their home country. 21.3 million of these 65.3 are refugees, and 3.2 million people are asylum seekers, and, and lots of different organizations use the term <coughs> asylum seeker in slightly different ways, but what the United Nations mean by that is, these are individuals whose refugee status hasn't been fully processed. All right, so, oops. Oh. I should have not missed that clip. All right, so when we look at global refugee flows, again for the year 2015, this chart here gives you a sense of where most refugees really come from. 
And the, the bar that we're interested in here in particular is the blue bar for each country, because it gives us the number of refugees in each of those 10 different countries, um, or the number of refugees that come from each of those 10 different countries. <coughs> we see that the biggest country that has uh, sent refugees or created refugees within the year 2015 is Syria. So roughly 5 million people in 2015 became refugees uh, in Syria. Number two is Afghanistan, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Central African Republic, Myanmar, Eritrea, and Colombia. So without really going too much in detail about any of those countries, what we see here is that these are really conflict hotspots. And it already starts to tell us a little bit about some of the factors that make people refugees in the first place. We're not talking about economic problems here, but we're talking really about widespread militarized violence happening within countries that really create those refugee flows. So let me move on and talk a little bit about refugees in the United States. So which specific countries are those countries that create refugees that are then being resettled into the United States? And the data that I'm presenting to you come directly from the U.S. Department of State. And what the U.S. Department of State basically tells us is that between 2013 and 2016, so the past four years, a little bit under 300,000 people from many of those countries that I just mentioned have become refugees and have been resettled to the United States. We can break down this figure a little bit further. Uh, we see that from in 2013, 2014, in 2015, we have about 70,000 people um, per year that were resettled into the U.S. And recently, in the most recent year, 2016, the number was a little bit higher, it was 85,000 people. Now, which specific countries are we talking about? So let me break this up uh, in, in two different ways. I will first want to show you the total number of refugees coming from top five countries from 2013 to 2015. And then I'm showing you the breakdown of the countries for the most recent year, 2016. So in 2013 to 2015, the single biggest sending country of refugees was Iraq. So in this time window, in those three years, about 52,000 people have come as refugees from Iraq. The number two country is Burma. So just a little bit under, under 50,000 people have come from Burma. The third country would be Somalia with 25,000 people. The fourth country would be Bhutan with 23,000 people. And then last but not least, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is the fifth biggest sending country for refugees for the United States with a little under 15,000 people. Again, in this time we know. If we look at the year 2016, we see that the general picture remains roughly the same. Those five countries still sent a lot of refugees or created a lot of refugees that were taken in by the U.S., but one country broke into this ranking, and that's Syria. So specifically, in 2016, um, the United States has taken in a little over 12,000 refugees from Syria, which is a little over 15% of the total number of refugees sent to the United States in 2016. When we look at Idaho in particular, we see that um, the picture will be very similar. So when we're looking at the uh, state of Idaho, we see that every year since 2013, the state of Idaho has taken in roughly 1,000 refugees a year. So in 2013, we have 920. In 2014, 978. 2015, 935. And last but not least, in 2016, the most recent year, we have the highest number, which is 1135. <coughs> So where do those refugees uh, in Idaho come from? Well, the picture, as I already alluded to, um, mirrors the picture that we have for the United States as a whole. So those would be the top five countries for the United States um, in 2013, 14, 15, and 16. And if I may move this just a little bit, because this is at a rather inconvenient spot right now. Um, we see that over from 2013 to 2016, the number one um, source country is the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, with a total of a little over a thousand refugees. Iraq is number two, Myanmar is number three, Somalia is number four, Bhutan is number five, and then um, Syria has historically not been a source country for a lot of refugees in Idaho, but specifically in 2016, 
um, Idaho has taken in about 158 refugees from Syria. Overall, over the time window of the last four years, this is only a relatively small percentage, but um, specifically in the most recent year, we see that Syria is actually number two just after the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So what I want to do now is I want to talk about maybe just two countries and give you a sense of what's happening in those states. Give you a sense of what exactly are those factors that, that create refugees in those states. And many of us, maybe while we are uh, listening or watching or reading the news, have heard about the civil war in Syria before. And that's, of all the conflicts that are represented on this chart, is probably the most well-known one. I decided to focus on two conflicts that are maybe not in the news as much in order to provide a little bit of detail and background about those. The first um, um, conflict I want to talk about is the conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So if you look at the charts that I showed you earlier, this is probably the biggest um, source country for refugees in, in the United States. And um, when we're talking about the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we're talking about a country that's basically roughly the size of Western Europe. So this is a massively huge country um, that's at the same time relatively poor. And if we ask them the question about why do so many refugees come from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I think it's important to remind ourselves that what happened there in the late 1990s and early 2000s was a major militarized conflict within the borders of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, but also between Congo and its immediate neighbors. So basically what happened there is, we had a genocide happening in one of Port, uh, Congo's neighbors in Rwanda. The genocidaires, the people who committed the genocide, then escaped across the country border into the Congo, and then Rwanda invaded Congo in order to hunt down those people who committed this genocide. So this massive war that happened in this, during these seven years caused a lot of displacement. <coughs> people were directly worried about their livelihoods. It was a very brutal conflict, and people escaped from the Congo into many of the neighboring countries. But unfortunately, even the war has been over for about 14 years now, Congo has not been able to fully recover. So even today, we see that the state institutions are very weak. And as soon as you move outside of the capital of the Congo, which is Kinshasa, the central government has a very hard time controlling what's going on in different regions of the country. We have numerous rebel groups, basically in the east, the west, the north, and the south, that contest the power of the central government, and what's worse, that have that um, in order to generate revenue for their own military <coughs> operations, um, they are basically looting um, the property of civilians. There is sis uh, systematic rape and systematic discrimination against people in, uh, away from the capital. And the central government simply can't do anything about that. The other thing that the Congo is um, really, um, well, that's a really big problem in the Congo is that there are significant ethnic divides. The Congo is a very diverse country, culturally speaking. We have literally hundreds of different, of, different of ethnic groups here. And some of these groups, particularly in the eastern part of the country, are perceived to work for foreign powers. So even if your family, if you belong to a group called the Banyamulenge, if you lived in this country for decades, and you've never lived in any other region of, in any other country before, you're still being discriminated against because there's a widespread belief that you're basically only here in order to support the influence of foreign powers, and you're not a real Congolese citizen, but you're sort of affiliated with a country that has historically meddled in your affairs. Because of these two factors, the people living in those refugee camps in Congo's neighbor states, they can't really move back. So even though the conflict is over now, they don't really have a chance to move back to their homes, but they are stuck in those refugee camps. And the conditions in those refugee camps in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Angola, in Uganda, they are very, well, they're very problematic. So there's very limited sanitation. Food is being provided through the United Nations oftentimes, but not as plentiful as we would want it to be. People don't really find a lot of work there. They're not allowed to work in some of those refugee camps, so there is widespread boredom. There is, um, there is uh, sexually based violence, and um, the living conditions for those people in those camps are really dismal. Um, just checking on doing the time. 
The second conflict I just want to talk about that has become just recently over the last few weeks moved into the media a little bit, but not as much as it probably deserves, is, uh, is the, are the conflicts that happen in the country of Myanmar or Burma. It's the same country, it just receives different names. So we're talking about a country in Southeast Asia here. And just like the Congo, we're talking with Myanmar or Burma, we're talking about a country that's ethnically and religiously very, very, very diverse. Now, the majority ethnic group would be Bamar in Myanmar. The majority religion would be Buddhism. But in addition to, to these ethnic and religious groups, we have lots of other cultural groups that, uh, that exist in the borders of this country. And what we see in Myanmar is that over the past few decades, there is systematic discrimination against various religious and ethnic groups. So if you just uh, belong to a certain cultural group, or if you follow a particular religion, the government for a long time and non-government forces also to some extent systematically discriminate against you and hunt you down. The group that has received the most attention here recently are the Rohingya. So this is a group that's specifically living in this part of the country, in this dark and yellow part of the country. And the Rohingya are a group that have lived in, in Myanmar for a very long time. 1.1 million people, they are mostly Muslims, and the United Nations calls them as one of the most persecuted minorities worldwide. And the reason why they are so persecuted is, over the past few decades, they have been denied citizenship in Myanmar, and the, the government in Myanmar has basically said, you're not real citizens of Myanmar, we consider you to be migrants from Bangladesh. And people will say, no, we've lived here for the last two generations, we have nothing in common with people in Bangladesh, um, but the government basically just makes the statement and uh, deprives people of this very basic right of citizenship. What's worse, over the last few weeks, um, there have been UN reports on ethnic cleansings. So the government, in, uh, or government forces, army forces, and non-governmental forces have moved into this eastern part or western part of the country and systematically tracked down, <coughs> down, killed and raped members of those Rohingya groups based on those long-standing grievances between different ethnic groups. <coughs> so this should just give you a little bit of an insight of what's happening in those two different conflicts. If you have any questions about other conflicts, such as the war in Syria or other countries that I mentioned earlier, I'm sure that we have some time during Q&A or later on. But um, I wanna, for now, I just want to close with this here. would like to thank you for attention. I'm going to turn over to my colleague.